Hello, and welcome back to Missouri Civil War. Today we continue with the intractable guerrilla violence in the state and the Union Army's struggle to contain it. Federal control over the Missouri countryside was always tenuous at best. This guerrilla insurgency, to borrow a term from the 21st century, underscored the Army's vulnerability. The fact that so much of rural society resisted the presence of Union troops gave federal commanders few good solutions to this chaos. We begin today by reviewing the Union's counterinsurgency measures, what one historian has described as a dominion system. We'll next consider the particular challenge before General Thomas Ewing, Jr., the officer charged with containing guerrilla violence along the Kansas border. Convinced that the Army could not stop these bushwhackers without first eliminating their basis of support, Ewing moved boldly, and his policy set off a series of events that brought the guerrilla war to its terrible climax. At this point, you're familiar with the basic elements of counterinsurgency policy. According to Christopher Phillips, this policy taking shape in 1861 and 1862 resembled a dominion system or, quote, an integrated, if imperfectly implemented knot of measures, end quote. It was administered by Union commanders, as well as by state officials, federal officials, and carried out by low-level commanders at posts across the state. This system had six parts, military districts and garrisons, assessments and levies, martial law, the provost marshal system, trade regulations, and lastly, and perhaps most odiously, the oath of allegiance. It's valuable to re review these interlocking parts, both to see how, fe how much federal officials tried and, and how ineffectual these, these measures proved. The key point I want to highlight is that the local nature of anti-guerrilla policies meant that there was wide uh, disparities in, in how these measures were executed. Authorities are often dependent upon civilian informers. And even as Union troops are organized into regional districts centered around various posts, they're still charged with controlling a huge territory. Uh, one example, Captain George C. Marshall, no relation as far as I know to the World War II George Marshall, left his post at Sedalia with 300 militiamen and three companies of regular U.S. cavalry. They traveled northeastward on a 10-day scout to track down Confederate guerrillas. Throughout their scout, they foraged and encamped almost exclusively on the farms of known or suspected rebels. By the time they circled back to Sedalia, they had marched or ridden some 200 miles, just within west central Missouri. Another complicating factor for Union authorities was the way that divisions over slavery had begun to divide troops within the state. These ideological divisions became apparent within the enlistment process. The Missouri State Militia, uh, which had been created by provisional governor Hamilton Gamble, it was dominated by loyal slaveholders and other pro-slavery men. These conditional Unionists also made up the greater number of Unionist home guards in the state. Anti-slavery men, who tended to come from St. Louis or Kansas, they were more likely to enlist in the U.S. Army, not the state militia. On July 22, 1862, John Schofield issued Order No. 19, which sought, which sought to halt this divisive trend by replacing the older Missouri State Militia with a new, more reliable uh, organization, which was called the Enrolled Missouri Militia. As requested by Governor Gamble, every able-bodied man in Missouri was required to enroll. He was to be raised, controlled, and paid for by the state of Missouri. Gamble and Schofield would face sharp criticism for their insistence that all men, even those who had aided and supported the South, enroll in the new militia. By war's end, roughly 50,000 men enlisted in the EMM. Of that total, only 30,000 would be armed. And as before with the founding of the Missouri State Militia, many state leaders assumed that Missourians were more likely to embrace their own serving to defend their own state than they would federal troops from outside. In the summer of 1863, the task of subduing the guerrillas that roamed across western Missouri fell to Union Brigadier General Thomas Ewing. Ewing was uniquely positioned to confront this crisis along the Kansas border. 
Ewing had come to Kansas Territory in the late 1850s. He made a modest living as a Leavenworth attorney and real estate speculator. As the son of Thomas Ewing, the powerful Whig senator from Ohio, Thomas Ewing Jr. emerged as a leader in the Free State Movement, and he eventually became the first Chief Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court. Within a year of resigning that position, Schofield appointed him to command the Union's newly created District of the Border, which included several counties in both Missouri and in Kansas. Ewing saw that Union troops were often outmanned in much of Missouri. In June 1863, he penned a report stating that several thousand Confederate troops had returned to the district, motivated largely by a desire to defend their households. Many of these men, he noted, were not inclined to join the country's growing band of guerrillas, but many were, offering fresh recruits to Quantrill and other irregular fighters. Ewing requested more regular cavalry from Schofield. He organized new volunteer cavalry companies from Kansas. This put his total force at 94 officers and roughly 1,700 men. Yet even this larger force, for the reasons we've discussed, um, it was insufficient. Union cavalry were stretched, thin, were stretched thin across a hundred mile border, much of which was open with no river or natural barrier to separate the states. Ewing feared that it was only a matter of time before the combustible situation exploded. Unable to rid the countryside of the guerrillas themselves, Ewing concluded that Union forces must eliminate their basis of support. He professed a reluctance to strike at the female kinfolk whose support sustained the guerrillas. Nevertheless, Ewing kept close tabs upon the mothers, sisters, and wives, and other kinfolk of known bushwhackers. He wrote, quote, about two-thirds of the families on the occupied farms of the region are kin to the guerrillas and are actively and heartily engaged in feeding, clothing, and sustaining them. I can see no prospect of an early and complete end to the war on the border so long as those families remain there." End quote. The general, he kept a handwritten list of 80 such households in the vicinity of independence, along with their location and their relation to known guerrillas. And you can see this list. You go to the Library of Congress in Ewing's papers, uh, you see marginal comments like, husband in the bush. Uh, he was keeping close tabs. Ewing proposed rounding up these women and resettling them elsewhere. He believed that the guerrillas, once they lost their source of food, clothing, and shelter, they would soon follow their kinfolk out of the state. There were plenty of precedents for such bold action against civilians, including women and children. In February 1863, Union troops in Cass County, south of Kansas City, set fire to the home of Bersheba Younger, whose son Cole was one of the guerrillas who rode with William Quantrill. Younger took refuge north of Missouri River for the duration of the war, but Ewing's proposal contemplated a resettlement of Southern families beyond the state's borders. Once removed, these men, he said, might even be forgiven their service. Um, but by J late July, Union troops in western Missouri had begun to arrest several female relatives of known guerrillas. Two of the women, Nanny Harris McCorkle and Charity McCorkle Kerr, were apprehended while en route to Kansas City to exchange wheat for flour. It was flour, of course, that well could have ended up in the bellies of local guerrillas. Many of these women were then held in buildings throughout Kansas City, awaiting their removal from the state. On August 3rd, Ewing wrote to Schofield to lay out his plan. He said, I think that the families of several hundred of the worst of the men should be sent, with their clothes and bedding, to some rebel district south and would recommend the establishment of a colony of them somewhere on the St. Francis or White River in Arkansas. Schofield in St. Louis granted his approval. It would soon be codified in order number 10. But before Ewing could issue it publicly, events in western Missouri took a tragic turn. On Thursday, August 14, 1863, one of the makeshift jails in Kansas City collapsed. This three-story building sat at 1425 Grand Avenue and had been vacated since its owner, 
Missouri State Treasurer and Unionist George Caleb Bingham had moved to Jefferson City with his family. At the time of the collapse, at least 10 women, none of them over the age of 20, were on the building's second floor. Four of the young women were killed, and the others, although badly bruised, survived. The victims' outraged families claimed that Unionists were complicit in their deaths, having knowingly put them in a derelict death trap. Wild rumors soon swirled. One suggested that Union troops had undermined the building's supports in order to kill the women. Another said that pigs rooting near the foundation had fatally weakened the structure. An article by Charles Harris in the Missouri Historical Review is the best treatment of this question, and it fairly takes apart the charges of conspiracy. In Harris's words, if the authorities had determined to kill these women, they could not have picked a more time-consuming, cumbersome, or unreliable method. Two of the women, Charity Kerr and Josephine Anderson, had been sisters of men who rode with Quantrill. Their brothers, John McCorkle and Bill Anderson, clamored for revenge. Anderson soon became known as Bloody Bill. He swore an oath to kill all Union soldiers he met thereafter. And for the rest of his life, he carried with him a long silk, silk scarf, upon which he tied a knot for each of his kills. Upon his own death, that scarf had 53 knots. On August 18th, four days after the collapse, Ewing finally issued his Order No. 10. But by that moment, the time for his plan had passed. Quantrill's band had met that same day to discuss plans for a long-contemplated attack upon the town of Lawrence, Kansas. Quantrill had hoped to strike the town, where he had once lived and then fled in disgrace. But his lieutenants resisted this audacious plan. Lawrence stood more than 50 miles west of the state line, behind an unknown but surely stout Union defense. The prospects of surviving a three-day ride there and back seemed poor at best. But in the wake of this prison collapse, Quantrill's men cast aside their previous reservations. The tragedy in Kansas City thus became a catalyst for the worst atrocity of the entire Civil War. For next time, we take up that story. Until then.